Thank you, Dr. The uh, check is in your office mailbox. <laughs> it, it should be there. Growing up in church, I learned early on how important a properly placed parentheses can be. Uh, you know what a parentheses is, right? It's those marks that usually come at the end of a clause or phrase to uh, add to an otherwise complete thought a qualification um, or to explain what you've just said. Uh, whether it was a Sunday school teacher or the preacher or just the members of the church talking in the foyer after the service, I learned that one of the keys to religious speech is knowing where to put the parentheses when you're talking, how to qualify the particular religious claims that you're making. It can make all the difference in the world, really. Uh, say out loud in front of others, we should do more to help the homeless. And in no time at all, inevitably, you'll be asked to help at a soup kitchen or work the food pantry or any other number of things that ruin the quiet weekend you had planned for yourself. But say out loud in front of others, we should do more to help the homeless, and then add in parentheses, as long as they're not dangerous and willing to help themselves, and suddenly you're a compassionate and practical member of the congregation. Parentheses can be handy that way. They can get you out of overstatements, release you from commitments you no longer wish to keep, and give you a way out of the thing you might not be so sure of anymore. It really all depends on where you put the parentheses. I like to think this text, the text that I've chosen, the parable of the Good Samaritan, as we know it, is really a story about where to put the parentheses in discipleship. Uh, you know the story. A lawyer comes up to Jesus and asks, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks the lawyer, well, what do you think? Well, uh, you should love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. Well, good answer, Jesus says. Uh, do this and you'll get it. But that's probably not what the lawyer had in mind. What with Jesus quizzing him and then the whole conversation being over so quickly. Besides that, there was this tricky little loophole in Jewish law about the definition of a neighbor. You know, is my neighbor the woman across the street who never mows her grass? Uh, is the couple in the apartment across the hall with the noisy dog? Are, are they my neighbor? What about the citizens of Baghdad? Do they count Afghanistan? Do they fit the definition? What about the guy on the street corner? You know, the one with the cup of change at the stoplight. Is he my neighbor? Is my neighbor the person at church who gets on my nerves? Or what about the preacher that never shuts up? Surely he does not fit the definition of a neighbor. See, there's this big parenthesis that, that has to be filled in. So the lawyer asks one more question. And who is my neighbor? If the lawyer in Luke's story is any indication, questions of faith and discipleship have a way of inviting discussions over when and where to put parentheses like no other questions really do. It's not that big of a surprise, really. I mean, any God who says, turn the other cheek and go the second mile is just asking for his disciples to come along and try to fill in the parentheses uh, after he says them. I mean, those kinds of commands, they're just asking for case law, a list of necessary and sufficient conditions for a parentheses that spells out who my neighbor is and when I'm obligated to help. Uh, for those of us who have chosen to spend our lives working with that incredibly dysfunctional body of people we call the church, the temptation to add parentheses can feel not just important, but really necessary for survival. I, I mean, especially since the congregations or parishes that you and I will be going to, to work for, will one day in, expect us to uh, revitalize worship, attract other young people, Increase giving, build attendance, preach inspiring sermons, reach out to the neighbors, navigate the culture wars without making anyone angry, strengthen Christian identity, engage Christian practice, and anything else you might be able to think of to help the church survive the season of change we're in. 
Of course, if you're one of the lucky ones, then there won't be any of those expectations, and instead you'll go to a place that just expects you to meet every emotional need they ever have. And good luck with that. Uh, with so much riding on our shoulders, it seems natural that those of us going into ministry and preaching would also need a legal degree to go along with it, to establish case law, to draw the lines and around discipleship, and to figure out when discipleship is required and when it isn't, to figure out where the parentheses go in our ministries and how to fill them in. But if Jesus' response to the lawyer is any indication, then even though we might rush to fill the parentheses in, Jesus presents us with a different vision of life and a different vision of ministry. He tells this incredible story about a man stranded on the side of a road and a Samaritan who goes out of his way to offer help. And when the story's finished, he asks, which one was a neighbor to the man who was in trouble? Well, I guess the one who showed him mercy. Well, then go and do likewise. Jesus doesn't try to fill in the parentheses of who our neighbors are, but instead he asks the question, which one was a neighbor? Jesus, he takes all of our attempts to try to figure out who our neighbors are and under what conditions we have to help them, and he envisions in their place a world and a people who have been formed and shaped so that they no longer ask, who is my neighbor? But instead they ask, am I living neighborly? In other words, I think Jesus envisions for his followers a discipleship that isn't defined by external factors, that isn't only as faithful as the circumstances around us allow us to be. He envisions a community of neighbors. I guess he envisions what you could call unparenthesized discipleship. That's what he envisions. Here's a question. Is this a tough, harsh story? Or is it good news? A couple of semesters ago, I had the opportunity to work as a teaching assistant in one of the freshman Bible courses here at ACU. They were freshmen who didn't want to be in a Bible course and they didn't want me as their teacher, but they were in a Bible course and they had me as their teacher. And one of the things we would always do is we would start the class by reading a scripture, by reading a story. And, and one Friday we read this. And I asked them, you know, what stands out to you? Do you have any questions, observations? And, and one of the girls raised her hand in the class and said, uh, do you think uh, this, this lawyer, has Jesus ever met him before? Did they know each other from somewhere? I said, I don't think so. This seems to be the first time they've met in Luke's gospel. Why do you ask? Well, I'm just wondering, you know, when this guy asks what he must do to get eternal life, and Jesus tells him a story and then says, go and do likewise. I, I, I'm wondering if Jesus knew there was something in this guy that led him to believe he was actually capable of doing it. And, and then she said, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here at ACU and I've been in church all my life and I want to follow Jesus. But I think about all the ways I pass people by on the side of the road. But I'm thinking that maybe Jesus sees in me potential for discipleship that, well, I don't really see in myself sometimes. And you know, she was a freshman in college, but I think she's right. I, I think she's right. That Jesus sees in us the possibility for discipleship that we don't see in ourselves most of the time. So he tells us a story. And he calls us to something more. 
you know, I have no doubt that the kind of discipleship Jesus envisions in this story, in this text, will cost each of us more than we're willing to give most of the time. It may take us to places that we never wanted to go in the first place. And after all, trying to live as a neighbor is a lot harder than trying to figure out just who your neighbors are. But by the incredible grace of God, Jesus envisions and gathers around himself this community of followers who are shaped and who live differently. They live differently. It's a community of disciples who witness in the life of Jesus what it means to be a neighbor. They see neighbor embodied. And then they go and they do likewise. Thanks be to God.